الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم أما بعد حبيت في الله continue on in our study of بلوغ مرام the book of marriage the chapter of uh, chapter two the relations with the wives so this chapter still is a continuation of the or where we've reached in this chapter is a continuation of uh, the topic of how the husband and wife relate to one another within the marital bond and that we mentioned that this is built upon mercy and it's built upon understanding and tolerance and kindness with one another and we also in the last lesson we talked about some of the rights uh, that the husband and wife both share like the ones we just mentioned of enjoying one another meaning physically uh, and the concern commanding the good and forbidding the evil the concern for the spiritual well-being of one another cooperating in righteousness and trying to maintain a righteous household and then some of the more specific duties we talked about that the for example the husband has over the wife one of the most important rights is that he has the right that when he calls her to bed that she uh, answers his call that she fulfills that duty and hopefully it's not a mechanical uh, a mechanical just fulfilling of the right but hopefully that there's love and that there's uh, the concern for the enjoyment of one another uh, in fulfilling this uh, this duty uh, this Islamic duty that they have uh, together and uh, uh, so this is a right of the husband over the wife another and, and one of the most key rights and also we mentioned that he has the right uh, you know that he can give her the responsibility of you know educating the household and, and and taking care of those those household duties especially with regards to if there's children and beautifying herself and the other key right is a general obedience to the husband as long as it isn't doesn't involve disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as far as the right of the wife upon the husband the key rights there are aside from all the kindnesses and all the other things that we mention is that he he takes care of her uh, that he is responsible for her uh, her clothing her shelter and her food uh, and of course her mental spiritual uh, well-being as well so that the husband is is responsible for the spending and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fi kitab al-kareem al-rijal al-rijal qawimun ala nisa that the men are the maintainers and protectors of the women so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this status to men over women and that their the women's right over their husband is that they are maintained and so that brings us on to the hadith the 872nd hadith according to my uh, reading of my book uh, the hadith narrated Hakim ibn Muawiyah on the authority of his father radiallahu ta'ala an I asked O oh, Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what are the rights of a wife of one of us on her husband he replied you should give her food when you eat clothe her when you clothe yourself not strike her on the face and do not revile her or desert her except within the house uh, reported by Ahmed Abu Dawood Al Nisa'i and Ibn Majah Al Bukhari mentioned part of it meaning the last statement uh, last sentence as mu'allak meaning a broken chain uh, from the side of the co uh, the collector of the hadith Al Bukhari Ibn Hibban and Al Hakam graded it as sahih as authentic this hadith is uh, a very important hadith the meaning of which shows us the uh, 
basic Islamic rights of the wife over the husband. So that's the general mawdu' or subject matter of this hadith, which is very important for us to pay attention and benefit from. So these are the rights, and it's exactly as the uh, as was mentioned, because he said, I asked, O Messenger of Allah, what are the rights of the wife of one of us on her husband? So there was the exact, uh, in this exact in this question, it is a question which clarifies the subject matter of this um, of this uh, of this hadith, and this subject matter is very important for us to understand because it entails the rights of the woman over her husband in Islam. Some of the many uh, benefits. of this hadith one of the first benefits is that this hadith illustrates the vigilance of the sahaba uh, to learn their religion and seek and do talib al-ilm from the prophet sallallahu talib al-ilm why to get to jannah to know the correct way to practice their religion and this is why some of the Salaf, some of the classical scholars from the first three generation used to say Talib al-ilm, uh, uh, Talib al-jannah. Uh, al that seeking knowledge is seeking paradise. So that the requirement of seeking knowledge is that there's sincerity to be able to practice your religion, not just for the sake of memorizing, the sake of this, they can, uh, of some worldly gain, but it's to increase and better one's relationship with Allah So this hadith illustrates for us the hars or the vigilance of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and this comes from the statement in the hadith when he said, Ya Rasulullah, ma haqqa zawj Ahaduna alayhi, alayhi. What is the right, O oh Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is the right of the wife of any one of us over the husband, over her husband? So here it's showing that the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala mijra'in, they wanted to know, they wanted to be clear. They wanted to know those rights because they wanted to be obedient to Allah. They wanted to follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, alayhi can be sunnati. He said, it's upon you my sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa'atiyu Allah wa'atiyu Rasul and obey Allah and obey His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The second benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates those rights that it is an obligation for the man to spend on his wife. And uh, uh, provide her, her 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 food and her clothing, and this is comes from this hadith, as as was mentioned in the hadith, that when he asked about that right, you should give her food when you eat, clothe her when you clothe yourself. Okay, showing us the importance of fulfilling her rights, and those are her rights as is given by Allah Jal. Uh, in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The third benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that the the amount of spending that the husband should spend in accordance with his ability. And what exactly does that mean? That means for, for us to understand that if the husband is a wealthy hus uh, a wealthy man, then he has a greater ability, obviously, to spend. He can buy his wife a new, brand new um, uh, MacBook Pro or whatever the case may be because he has the wealth and the means to do so. A wealthy man, perhaps he, can, he has more than one wife and she says, I want a house as my mahar or I want you to, uh, you know, all the, these kinds of things because he is a very wealthy man. So we're talking about someone who's very wealthy. And then someone who's 
who's more maybe middle class or who doesn't have the same ability, then he must spend in accordance with his ability. She needs a new phone. Maybe he, he can afford that phone easily. So he should not uh, restrict her from those things. And likewise, the one who doesn't have much of anything, say, for example, when we talked about in the first hadith, in the beginning of this uh, chapter of Nikah, the book of, of marriage, we talked about those, uh, you know, some of the different conditions that the ulama mentioned with regards to, um, you know, the ability of getting marriage and when it becomes an obligation and when it's actually disliked and when it can actually be haram and the, the different ahkam. So a, a husband who's restricted in his means, say he did get married, but he's very poor. And then she says, you know, I want a house. Or she says, I want, and I want this now, you know, I want the nicest, you know, they, maybe they're almost homeless. They live in a shelter. They live, uh, maybe they can't even afford to live together. Right now he's in transition. He's living in the masjid. She lives with her parents. Whatever the case may be, these are real scenarios that we deal with, especially in our societies, in the Western societies. We have these, uh, some of these difficulties. And every society has their own complex uh, problems. And so the point being is the ability may be restricted. So it will be unreasonable for her to say, you know, I want a new iPad and we they don't even have an apartment. Or she makes some unreason, you know, I want my own car. I need a, and I want a very nice car. And they don't even live together because he uh, can't afford an apartment right now. You know, so so it's very important to look. This, this hadith shows us that it's an, ob an obligation upon the husband to spend in accordance with his, his ability. And everyone's ability differs. So this will go back to the orf and the, and the ability of the particular husband. Uh, and the orf I mean by the custom. Uh, the third benefit we get from this hadith is this hadith, uh, or the fourth benefit is this hadith also shows us that uh, the prohibition for a husband to strike his wife in the face, that this is prohibited in Islam. And in fact, when we look at the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we see he didn't strike his wives. And we're ordered to follow what? We're ordered to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not the Sunnah of the um, the days of Jahiliyyah, and not the Sunnah of anyone else, except for the Khulafa Rashidin al Mahdiin, those righteous predecessors uh, meaning, uh, and, and, and specifically the Sahaba, more specifically uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, but the asl of what we are ordered to do is following the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his sunnah, and anyone who follows under his sunnah, then we follow that. So, letting us know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't strike his wives. So, in many cases, in most cases, and also depending upon the society, you will find that there is no benefit in trying to strike, in striking your wife. Even if it is something light, that she will, will not accept that in many cultures. And this will cause a greater harm to you. In many, in the Western societies, this is called spousal abuse. And if you strike your wife, even, uh, uh, especially if it's something that can be proved and you, you've left a mark on her, which is also prohibited in Islam, then you will go to jail in America. So uh, in Canada, I believe, is similar. And probably the UK is similar in other societies. And so it depends on the culture and the society as well as what your consequences will be. But going back to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which we're ordered to do, is you should not strike your wife. That does not mean it's prohibited to as a means, as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained. And he said it's prohibited to strike the face. So if there is a, a maslaha, some benefit, and it is not going to cause a greater harm by doing so, then there is, uh, then this is a uh, something which is permissible in that sense. So definitely not striking to hurt her, not leaving a mark, upon your wives, but in many cases, this is not the case where there is benefit. Another benefit of this hadith is it shows takrim al-wajh. It shows the, the 
that the 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 face is uh, you, you could say sacred that it is it, it is a very something very important in Islam and especially in accordance because this was the case also in the Arab culture as well in who this uh, uh, you know the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi was Arab and the revelation was revealed to him and it you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with in his revelation in uh, and we see throughout the Quran and the Sunnah the importance of the face the face is mentioned and the face is so it, this hadith illustrates for us that the face is something very important that you shouldn't strike in the face this is not just in the marital bond but even this is why some of the scholars they mention or many of the scholars say boxing and all these kind of sports because of hitting the face and, uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates the prohibition of the prohibition of uh, of making something detestable whether that be physically or whether that be uh, what is known as manawi maybe you could say spiritually and uh, you know in a, in a non-physical way so for example that when you strike someone this is a physical way of of uh, assaulting them and causing them harm and um, uh, to to you know this it generally has a is a negative uh, result a negative uh, a, a form of action and if we uh, an, uh, an, another negative form in which is as we mentioned manawi or you know could be spiritually it could be uh, in another way is that for example if a husband he is cursing his wife this is not physical but there is still harm or he says that you're ugly or, or whatever he, he insults her this is also, this ha can have a spiritual relationship, but it's also a, a mental harm, to mentally abuse. So Islam uh, prohibits, and we learn this from this hadith, prohibits the physical and the mental and the spiritual abuse. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us, or we gain from this hadith, the impermissibility of of uh, making hijra of your spouse outside of the house, meaning uh, to the husband cannot, uh, for example, out of anger and say, "I'm gonna, you know, because you've been acting up, or you know, whatever the case may be, I'm gonna leave the house for two to three days." Or whatever. No, the hajr between the husband and the wife, as is mentioned in the Quran, and the details we find in the Sunnah of the Prophet, uh, is that um, and we find in this hadith is within the house. Okay, and this is in accordance with the saying the Prophet said, and do not revile her or desert her except within the house. So the Prophet ﷺ let us know that taqbih, you know, to, to despise her and to, you know, to harm her and speak ill of her, to curse her, is impermissible. And we, we just talked about that as it's a, it could be physical, mental, or spiritually. And the, to desert her or to, uh, to make hajar of her, that this can only be done in the house. For example, you say, you know, I'm upset with you. You know, I'm going to sleep in the other room. I'm going to sleep in my library. I'm going to sleep in the other bed, or whatever the case may be. That this is, and this can be, have an effect on the wives if she is in the wrong about something. You don't make hedger of her because you're in the wrong. Okay, so that's very important. So at least we know this. Although we know that our natures, that a lot of times, May Allah forgive us all, 
that we don't comply with the Sharia a lot of times, and we make uh, hajr, you know, we cut off people and cut off our spouses due to our own arrogance sometimes, and our own foolishness sometimes, instead of going by the shara, that if there's a maslah, if there's a benefit, and you think the person's going to return back to good, then there would be uh, uh, a cause for this, and of course, it would not be outside the house, as the Prophet ﷺ said, when he said, uh, and do not revile her or desert her except within the house, letting us know it's in the house. Those are the key uh, benefits, and there are so many benefits. Uh, a last thing I want to mention is this hadith also illustrates for us the, uh, the completeness of the Sharia, that it encompasses and incorporates every aspect of our lives uh, that and through the na'ma and the, the, the benefit of the ulama, the scholars of Islam throughout history of, of the, the uh, of what they left behind you know we see the applicability in all the circumstances so in contemporary times we have our ulama they can look to these nasus, these texts and they can make their ijtihadat based upon these texts and that encompasses the Sharia and helps us to be able to practice when we don't find those details specifically for some issue within our uh, within our lives, whether that be family lives or any aspects of our, our lives and related to contemporary problems. So this shows us the completeness of the Sharia uh, and, and that it incorporates even these minor or these uh, not minor but very precise issues uh, even related to spousal relationships. The 873rd hadith narrated Jabir ibn Abdullah The Jews used to say when a man has intercourse with his wife through the vagina but from her backside the child will be squint-eyed. Then the verse came down, your wives are a tilth to you, so come to your tilth however you wish. Mutafakun uh, alayhi, agreed upon, uh, meaning in Bukhari and Muslim. So this hadith also is a continuation of the ways, the spousal relations, how the husband and wife relate to one another. And this is also, this hadith is illustrating for us the, again, one of the most important ri uh, rights for the husband that the husband has over the wife and that is that she comes to his bed uh, when he calls her and this hadith shows us some of the manners that are allowable or the the ways in which the husband and wife can have relations and it shows us the sharia that it does not uh, the sharia exalts shyness but when it comes to learning and those important aspects to understand uh, what the Sunnah of the Prophet and what's permissible, what's halal and what's haram, that the Sharia can sometimes be more explicit, but never in a vulgar way. That these things, people need to know what's lawful and what's unlawful. And we gain that from these types of nusus, these types of texts. One of the benefits of this hadith is this hadith shows us uh, that the Yahud, that the the Jews, that they had a really a false claim that had no authentic origin. That so they prohibited something that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala made lawful, and that the Sharia allows this practice uh, that the husband can come to his wife in whichever manner he wishes that they can have relations except those prohibited ones those clear clearly prohibited types uh, of relations and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says your wives are a tilth to you so come to your tilth however you wish so this lets us know that this type of relationship this type of uh, relations these types of relations are permissible Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, illustrates for us 
that the Quran is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is illustrated from the statement in the hadith when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or when uh, the Sahabi said, فَنَزَلَتْ meaning, uh, and then it was revealed. Letting us know what? It was revealed by Allah Azza wa Jal. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this. This is from revelation. This is the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The speech, the divine speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. And another benefit of this hadith is it shows that the husband and wife that they can enjoy one another uh, in halal fashion. Okay, this hadith shows us that that is a part of uh, Islam, that the, the husband and wife, of course, can enjoy one another. And as we mentioned, that is some of the, uh, the intention of the marital bond as well. Allah's made it a pleasurable thing and a pleasurable uh, means of fulfilling our desires uh, and, and a lawful means for fulfilling our desires. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is it shows that, of course, the husband and the wife are should not deny one another, and, the, and there's many problems that can result, but that ultimately this hawk of the of fulfilling those bonds, it is a greater one that the wife must fulfill this and come to the husband at his call because of the uh, the harm that causes when the men are denied. It's greater. Women generally tend to be better in patience and not that they have less physical needs, no, and not that their needs are imp not important, but just that the men, it's even more harmful for the men, that the men themselves, it's easy for them to wonder, as we know, and, and for them to go outside the marriage, either in a lawful way or an unlawful way. And this is why it is very important, this right. This is an important right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave uh, over the women from the side of the men. Uh, and, and uh, you know, showing us that there is, uh, you know, there's a great wisdom behind that. Uh, also, another issue or another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is very merciful and that he has given us many ways for the husband and wife to enjoy one another and, and that's from his rahmah that it wasn't so restricted that you could only have re what we consider uh, uh typical relations between the husband and wife, but yet they can enjoy one another in a variety of ways with creativity. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also is a, it's, it points to the prohibition of having sexual relations in the anus, that this is something impermissible. And this is understood because uh, from the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Fatu Harthukum, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says, and go to your uh, your gardens or your uh, your hearth. And that this is uh, that the what is understood by some of the scholars is that the harf that you know this shows that this is a place you know because a hearth you plant your seeds there and that of course you plant your seeds in uh, as far as the physical means between the husband and wife is that her pregnancy results from sexual intercourse uh, not through the anus Allah. another uh, those are some of the main benefits of this hadith and the scholars mention many uh, other ah 
chem or rulings per, uh, pertinent to this, like some of the more contemporary issues, and that have also been dealt with even by some classical scholars. Uh, people speak about a karma like oral sex and other types of activities. Are they halal and haram? Which is outside the scope of this hadith necessarily because the scholars, they differ over that. Some of them, they say this goes back to the, the, the custom and some say some of the more contemporary scholars here have made the, uh, from their ijtihad, have said this is uh, disliked but that it's permissible. Uh, and of course, and, and they are making their ijtihadat from their cultural perspective. Whereas in some cultures, it has become a very widespread practice, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And, and moving to the next hadith, uh, in the hadith of narrated uh, Ibn uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, if anyone who intends to have intercourse with his wife says, in the name of Allah, or, uh, uh, O Allah, keep us away from the devil, and keep the devil away from what you have provided us of children, should it be ordained that a child be born to them, thereby Satan will never harm it. Mutafqan uh, This hadith is very important. This hadith makes, uh, clarifies for us the adab, or the manners, of uh, sexual intercourse in Islam, that Islam has there's an Islamic mannerism for prior to intercourse, during intercourse, uh, and of course after intercourse. That all you know, all of these things we have a uh, an example in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam of the important mannerisms to observe. That this can actually, as the Prophet ﷺ said, when they asked, Ya Rasulullah, you know, can we be rewarded for having relations with one of our, if one of us has relations with his wife or his wives? And he says, wouldn't you be punished if you had it unlawfully? Meaning you had sexual relations in an unlawful fashion, visiting a prostitute, visiting, uh, you know, having zina outside the marriage. You'll be punished for this. That's a great, a major sin. So you'll either have some punishment in this life and the hereafter, or in this life. Or, 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 or meaning that the hereafter, you know, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive you if you make tawbah. But the point is, is that we're rewarded for that. So letting us know that there's also adab, there's also mannerisms to observe. That if someone has the intention that they actually want to uh, you know, they're enjoying themselves and they want to enjoy themselves in the a lawful way with their spouse in a halal fashion and their intention is to actually, you know, help them in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this, they'll be rewarded and by observing those Islamic mannerisms. Uh, and this shows us one of the pre, the mannerisms of uh, prior to the, uh, to sexual relations. And so the Prophet وسلم, said, you know, in this dua, that uh, he began with the Bismillah in the name of Allah, which shows us the importance of the uh, of saying the Bismillah to saying in the name of Allah before we do lawful activities. You know, when we give a lecture, when we uh, before we eat, even before relate sexual relations, it's still uh, asking for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's uh, uh, blessing for that activity that we're about to, you know, and, and assistance in that, uh, you know, and assistance in having to be successful in whatever that activity is, but also in, you know, seeking blessings from that activity. So seeking blessings here would be the case of, you know, when you're having sexual relations or you're eating food, that you are uh, that you are receiving blessings. You want to receive a blessings for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for doing this lawful uh, thing, this lawful uh, activity. And then it involves, you know, O oh Allah, you're imploring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, keep us away, uh, keep us away from the devil. You're imploring Allah, you're seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the shaitan. And keep the devil away from uh, and keep us away from the devil. And keep the devil away from what you have provided for us. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
decrees for you to have a child, you are imploring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is Tawheed, which is the worship of Allah. That's Tawheed al -ibadah. You are supplicating to Allah Azza wa Jal, asking Him to protect you and protect the potential child that you may have from the shaitan al rajim from the evil. Uh, and then the Prophet sallallahu in the end, he let us know that the shaitan will never be able to uh, uh, harm that child and this is agreed upon. So here, that we 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 see the importance of this uh, supplication, and this harm that you are seeking refuge in Allah from, this could either be physical, or it could uh, you know, you know some some physical harm and in their and related to their body. Or it could be a spiritual, spiritual or intellectual harm. So you're seeking refuge in Allah, asking Him. Or khulukiya, as well as uh, related to manners, that you're seeking refuge in Allah, that this child will not have harmful manners. So it shows us the importance of this dua, because here you're asking and imploring Allah for protection on all, you're covering all your bases as far as the meaning. This is the ulama, they deduce meanings from this hadith, from this dua. That's just from the supplication. So, it shows us the importance of this supplication because the shaitan can harm you in many ways. Or <coughs> there's many various types of harms that can come to you. Physical, mental, spiritual, uh, intellectual, intellectual harm. Uh, there is then uh, uh, also harms that can, uh, you know, you can have through maybe those deficiencies in your body or the harm that can be related to your manners, related to your, uh, to your, to your manners. Some of the main uh, benefits of this hadith. is that this hadith uh, encourages us to supplicate uh, uh, at the time of having sexual relations. So it's, it's, you know, it's prior to entering, uh, that the husband entering his, his wife. And we already talked about that this is a, uh, by supplicating this supplication, that this is seeking refuge in Allah from the shaitan in harming uh, the child especially. And so this uh, hadith uh, encourages us to do so. Another benefit of this hadith is it shows us the blessings of making the basmala. And that the basmala that we should do this, uh, you know, there's countless times before eating, before, uh, before uh, sacrificing an animal, uh, before, uh, and, and even before this having uh, the sexual relations. Another benefit of this hadith is it also shows us that if we don't make this dua there there could be a greater chance that the shaitan can overcome by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the shaitan can cause harm to that child. So this is an important protection that the mu'min should uh, uh, take Another uh, benefit of this hadith is also it also shows us the importance of learning prophetic dhikr, prophetic uh, ways of of uh, remembering Allah subhanahu wa taala. You know, memorizing hadith and remem memorizing the supplications of the Prophet sallallahu Those specific du'a. There are many du'a. Also, making du'a on your own, but especially at specific times learning some of those supplications that exactly as the Prophet ﷺ supplicated. So this hadith shows us the importance of learning this very supplication instead of just on your own saying Bismillah and you know coming up with your own dhikr or your own supplication in this particular manner that it's best to use the actual alfaz, the actual uh, terminology and the actual dhikr that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ did. Uh, this hadith also shows us the
that it is also permissible, this is a great faida from our ulama, the permissibility of making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the one who's even uh, naked, akramakum Allah, that the one who's in this house, because obviously when you're having those relations, except for possibly certain cultures, that the husband and wife are, uh, you know, they're naked, akramakum Allah, when they're enjoying one another. So, this hadith shows us that it's permissible to make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in that hal, even in that state. And so that's a refutation of those who say that that is impermissible. So those are some of the many benefits of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In the next hadith, uh, narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when a man calls his wife to come to his bed for marital relations, and she refuses to come, and he spends the night in anger, the angels curse her till the morning, Mutafqan alayhi, the wording is al-Bukhari's Muslim has, he who is in heaven is displeased with her till her husband is pleased with her. This hadith is very important and it shows us the importance of the right of the husband over the wife and uh, one of the most key uh, uh, rights that the husband has over the wife and that is that the husband, uh, that, that, that if he calls his wife to to have relations with him, that she does not refuse. So that's very, uh, a very important right that is with the, uh, in the right, the favor of the husband there. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that it is uh, good to, as we mentioned prior to this, uh, have a yukenni uh, or to make a uh, give speak about something that might be a sensitive issue uh, for example relating sexuality and relate and uh, those kind of physical relations with a uh, maybe metaphorically if if possible if it is possible when it is necessary to speak about those issues for example as we mentioned prior to this maybe a, a woman or a man is seeking a fatwa from a sheikh or what have you, and they are not very direct in their language. And we, we see this all throughout the uh, shara and in those ahadith which mention, and, and the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu which mention very sensitive topics that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions it perhaps in a metaphorical way as well as the Prophet Alayhi uh, Salaam. And we find that in this hadith. Uh, and another benefit of this hadith that if a woman uh, we learn is that if a woman does not answer the call of her husband for some legitimate reason that she falls under the that this is one of the major uh, sins that she falls under the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the malaika which is a wretched state to be in, that no one wants to have the malaika cursing them. So it's very important for the women to strive their best to meet the uh, this important right of the husband. And that there is a punishment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regarding this. And it shows us the importance of, uh, uh, of having uh, the importance of sexual relations in the marital bond, uh, and especially for the husband. This is very, very important. And uh, another benefit of this hadith, or uh, in relation to that also, that if, of course, there is a uh, conflict between an obligatory duty and, the, uh, and fulfilling this right, then, of course, doing the obligation per supersedes this right. Meaning, for example, the husband wants to have relations with his wife, and it's Maghrib time now. The Maghrib is coming in, so now he doesn't want to go to Salat, and he's trying to delay the Salat because he wants to have relations, then this would be impermissible for, uh, in this situation, and she would not, if the, if the wife denies her husband, she would not fall under this curse, or some other situation, perhaps it's a Ramadan, and the husband can't control himself, and he wants to have relations with his wife, which is a major sin, to break his fast, uh, and then it would be an obligation for him to pay kafara, 
you know, to expiate for that. Uh, and so if the husband is trying to infringe on this uh, this obligation that she has to Eliza Wajel, which is to fast, then she does not obey him in this. And she will have, of course, no sin for that because he is trying to uh, supersede those obligatory duties with something which uh, in that situation is not an obligation. So it would be not obligatory for her to obey him in that situation. Uh, another benefit of this hadith, which is very important, is that if the husband, for example, if the wife, she did refuse the husband, but then he's actually not angered by that. You know, he wanted to, and then he, he just says, okay, you know, I forgive you, Habibti, or whatever. Then in this situation, uh, in the law, there would be no sin for her uh, likewise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Uh, this also, this hadith affirms for us that the malaika exists because as the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned, that the malaika will uh, curse her till the morning. So this affirms for us that there are angels that uh, are around to witness uh, our affairs. Those are just some of the benefits uh, derived from this hadith. Uh, in the next hadith, uh, 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 narrated Ibn Umar and the Prophet وسلم, cursed the woman who joins false hair to her real hair, meaning extensions, and the one who asks for it to be done to her, and the woman who tattoos others, and the one who has done it for her. We'll talk about hadith. This hadith shows us, although this doesn't uh, directly deal with the uh, marital relationship, but this has to do with uh, impermissible acts regarding the women, I I impermissible uh, things that uh, the women in the time of Jahiliyyah, and we find that these are customs now which are very popular, uh, in which some women do, getting extensions and getting tattoos. We find that even uh, in the land of Tawheed, that there are some women who get tattoos. And, and even some others who get extensions in their hair. And this is open uh, disobedience to Allah because a lot of times the tattoos you have for people to look at. So that means she's probably not hiding those tattoos, at least in gatherings of women, but she's showing off the tattoo for others. She's showing off disobedience to Allah. So some of the uh, benefits we gain from this hadith is it shows that getting hair extensions and tattoos is from the major sins. And then we, we know this because the Prophet ﷺ, uh, said that there is curse attached to that. And we already mentioned that whenever there's a curse attached to a sin, this lets us know that it is from one of the major sins. Another benefit of this hadith is it shows us that to uh, to change the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by doing these disobedient ways of beautifying oneself, that these are impermissible, and these are a type of changing the creation, what, how Allah has created a person naturally, and showing displeasure towards that, and actually following the commands of the shaitan. So it's very important to avoid those sinful practices. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is it shows us the impermissibility of tattooing of being a tattoo artist as well as getting tattoos because the Prophet والسلام, mentioned that uh, the uh, the one for, who asked for it to be done and the one who tattoos and the one who has had it done for her that these are all cursed likewise uh, giving extensions and the one who the one who asked for it to be done to her the one who who does it and the one who asks for it to be done to her. So this is a very serious uh, warning for the women to avoid these uh, practices of jahiliyyah, which I happen to be very much in trend in this contemporary time. Wallahu musta'an. And the scholars mention, as far as, uh, just in general from this hadith, that it is not permissible for a person to change the natural creation of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
has created someone for the sake of just beautifying themselves. And, and this is spe specifically, this is related to the ahkam of the false hair and the uh, and the tattoos. And as far as getting uh, operations, uh, the scholars mention that regarding getting rid of some sort of aib, some sort of shortcoming, for example, a woman correcting her mouth for plastic surgery, you know, that she has, she was born or something uh, with some deformity, that this is permissible. Uh, so if it is the the so the dhabit or the criterion is if it is regarding changing some aib or some sort of uh, something which is harmful by her maintaining it. For example, women that get breast reductions because you know their breasts are too big and it is actually harmful for her. It's heavier. It's difficult on her back and things like this, then uh, these types of uh, operations are permissible because they are actually permitting, uh, uh, preventing a harm, uh, you know, some sort of health harm, which is uh, the woman is, is gaining by having such large breasts that she was created with. Likewise, as we mentioned, the uh, deformities, to correct uh, some sort of deformities, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows best. Uh, in the next hadith, narrated uh, Jundama, the daughter of uh, Wahab. I was with Allah's Messenger وسلم, along with some people when he was saying, I have intended to prohibit ghila, uh, sexual intercourse with a woman who is breastfeeding. But I considered the Romans and the Persians and saw that they engaged in ghila without any injury being caused to their children thereby. Then they asked him about Azim, withdrawing the penis before uh, you know, before uh, ejaculating, uh, to avoid contraception. And Allah's Messenger وسلم, replied, that is the secret way of burying a life reported by Muslim. Uh, this hadith is an authentic hadith, and from this hadith there are many uh, benefits. Some of the benefits is it shows us that the, the excellent uh, manners of the Prophet وسلم, in attending to the affairs of his ummah, and also that that the uh, uh, this is uh, shows in the concern for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for his ummah, and that he did not want to make something haram for them that would be a difficulty. You know, for example, the breastfeeding women if they couldn't have relations. You know, because that's a long period of time that women may breastfeed. And it would discourage women from breastfeeding in that situation. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that uh, Islam takes, uh, considers the harms and the benefits uh, with regards to uh, human beings' affairs. That uh, these things have a sharia present, that sh the sharia it looks to this very important guy there, this very important rule, looking at those things which are harmful and those things which are beneficial, and and taking those things into consideration. Another benefit of this hadith is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also was uh, legislated uh, in Islam that he was a prophet at salatu salam and that he legislated, and this was came through wahi, came through the legitimacy, was through uh, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why we're ordered to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu And this is, we see, the Prophet sallallahu said, I, I have intended to prohibit ghila with a woman who, uh, sexual intercourse with a woman who is breastfeeding. But I considered the Romans and the Persians saw that they engaged in it and there was no harm. So looking at the harms and the benefits and that the Prophet sallallahu uh, had intended to make that haram, but then there was no revelation for that. So his authority was the authority given to him by Allah, uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is also we see in the hadith that we already studied when the Prophet sallallahu said, Lola na shukka ala ummati li amartum bisawak, in the Kuli Salat. The Prophet sallallahu said, if it wasn't 
If I didn't think it was a harm upon my nation, then I would have commanded them to use the miswak with every prayer. Showing that the Prophet ﷺ looked to the harms and the benefits for his ummah, and he was concerned about his ummah, and that, uh, likewise, that he had this, uh, this authority that was given to him by Allah Azza wa Jal. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us in a very important rule that if there's benefit in something, that as long as there's no prohibition in the Sharia, even if it comes from the non-Muslims, that it's permissible to take it. So we, we learn from this hadith, this is one of the, the, the benefits that the ulama have, <coughs> have, the Allah, have derived from this hadith. Alhamdulillah. And those are some of the most uh, important benefits of this particular hadith. Uh, a, la a, a last uh, benefit, I, uh, uh, two benefits I want to mention that we, we have to mention with regards to this hadith. The first is, uh, so that it's permissible to ask questions about those things which we're normally shy upon when it comes to deriving, a sh to, to obtaining a sharia hukum, a sharia ruling. So something that you're shy about, that you should not have shyness if it is necessary. And as we mentioned prior to this, to not uncover the, the, the faults and sins of others, for example, your husband, for example, even yourself, that you can ask it in a roundabout way and you can also use uh, some sort of, uh, and, uh, you know, make it in a, a, a metaphorical way or analogous way when asking that questions instead of being so du direct about some specific details. And you don't have to uh, mention specific individuals in, in those cases unless there, you, unless the need, there be a need for that. Uh, likewise, uh, that from this hadith, some of the scholars like Ibn Hazm uh, get that it is impermissible to do azm, meaning to pull out for the husband to pull out before he ejaculates when having sexual intercourse <coughs> as a type of contraception. So, but the majority of the scholars say that it's permissible and we'll find out other evidence which shows us. And the reason that Ibn Hazm says that is because he said, then they asked him about azm. Uh, you know, and the, Allah's Messenger replied, that is the secret way of burying alive. So we know that burying alive is impermissible. So from this statement, Ibn Hazm and those scholars who believe that this is impermissible, they derive their hukum from that statement because that this is an impermissible action, meaning to bury children alive, of course, as a form of contraception. And the Prophet said that this is a minor way of doing that. So they understand from that that it's impermissible. But majority of the scholars hold a different view. <coughs> In the next hadith, uh, the 878th hadith, narrated uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala, a man said, O oh, Allah's messenger, I have a slave girl and I withdraw the penis while having intercourse with her, al -Azam. I dislike that she become pregnant, but I want from her what a man wants from a woman. And the Jews say withdrawing the penis to avoid contraception is the minor form of bearing a lie. He replied, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Jews told a lie, for if Allah intended to create you, create it, you would not be able to turn it away. Reported by Ahmed and Abu Dawood, the wording is Abu Dawood and Anisa'i. And, and an and a Tahawi also reported its narrators as uh, being reliable. So this hadith illustrates for us the opposite hukum and is an affirmation for us that the permissibility of this action of azm as a form of contraception. And again, it affirms for us the importance of using, if possible, some sort of analogy for something that we're normally shy about. So the man, he, he used an analogy, and this was a very, he was also very, you know, he didn't want to get his slave girl pregnant, so he was using this natural form, natural way of contraception. So it shows us the permissibility of doing so. 
because the Prophet Sallallahu allowed it. Uh, another benefit of this hadith, is that it shows that it is permissible for a person to, of course, if there's something that they dislike related to their wealth, uh, and that's going to be harmful towards their wealth, that they it's permissible for them to dislike that. So in this situation, because the man owned the slave girl, that this is a part of his wealth, and he did not want her to get uh, pregnant for uh, various reasons. So uh, this hadith shows the permissibility of doing so, uh, of this, this action. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is it shows us the permissibility if there is maslaha and if there is uh, a, a sharia reason, some sort of harm or something to uh, if a person uses contraceptive, uh, you know, uses this practice and, uh, you know, family planning, so to speak, under cer certain circumstances. So this hadith is evidence for that. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also uh, illustrates for us the permissibility of uh, azl, this, this practice of withdrawing the penis as a type of contraception. And this, uh, we'll talk more about that in the next uh, narration, in the next hadith. Uh, in the 879th hadith, narrated Jabir radiallahu ta'ala in the lifetime of the lost messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, when the Quran was being revealed, we used to engage in al-azm. Hence, if it had been something to be forbidden, the Quran would have forbade us from doing it. Mutafakun uh, alayh. And Muslim has that which we were doing reached the Prophet sallallahu and he did not forbid it from for, forbid us from doing it. And then the last hadith narrated Anas bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu used to have intercourse with his wives one after another with a single bathing uh, agreed upon. The wording is Muslim. So in the first uh, two hadith, uh, the one that that was in uh, Bukhari and Muslim in the narration of Muslim, we see the permissibility of Azil and that there was nothing that came to illustrate that this practice was impermissible, this type of contraception. And the scholars mention that there are some, uh, some conditions to be observed, is that both parties, one of the conditions being that both parties are uh, pleased with this or accepting of this contraception, meaning that a man cannot enforce this on his wife, you know, just pull out uh, and, you know, say, I don't want children or whatever, you know, I don't want you to get pregnant, but they should have a agreements for this practice. So this is uh, one of the conditions which is uh, important with regards to this, uh, this hadith. In the last hadith, uh, the hadith of Anas ibn Malik where the Prophet وسلم, used to have intercourse with his wives uh, and take one ghusl. This hadith shows us the permissibility of doing so, that it's permissible for a husband to do this. This does not mean uh, that he necessarily should because we know that also there can be, uh, sometimes can be harm in certain situations uh, for, for the people if the husband has not uh, made ghusl but of course the Prophet ﷺ, from his sunnah he would make wudu and clean his private parts so we know that this is a permissible uh, practice and we don't this hadith is not uh, does not illustrate for us because the Prophet ﷺ, from his his Uh, practice was to uh, make a wudu and uh, so also and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best that perhaps he would clean his private parts uh, as was his uh, his habit sallallahu alayhi wa so uh, but this hadith shows us the permissibility of doing so but of course we should 
uh, take in consideration because yeast infections and other practices can be thing uh, by having those fluids, uh, you know, and, and having relations with different women that you can uh, cause them to have uh, uh, ailments like uh, yeast infections and so forth. So it's important to at least wash the private parts before doing so. So this hadith also shows us the permissibility of of uh, delaying the ghusl, delaying the uh, taking the bath. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also shows that, and this is an important benefit, that even when dividing the times, and this is due to the strength of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, many men do not have this kind of prowess, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did this, you know, went to all of his wives in one night. So that means that the night was probably the night of one of them, but he went during that time, during that day, day and night that he went to each of his wives illustrating the prowess of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and also that it is not that having relations is not uh, that, that, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam was not uh, restricted to the specific time of having relations with his other wives if this is going, so some of the scholars, they make istidlal, they use this hadith to show that it's permissible to go uh, have relations with another wife during another wife's day if you're going to be able to, uh, to, uh, you know, have that prowess to be able to fulfill the other wife's right. And and also you know other situations can be for example it could be one wife's her time I mean she could be it would be her time of menstruation and it could be her time for having relations and the husband wants to have relations uh, so you know he could then and and Allah knows best with asking her permission about that because it is her night to go uh, have relations with his other wife whose time it isn't because this wife is unable to have relations, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but those are just some of the benefits derived from this hadith, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best.